Our offseason positional review continues today as we look at the tight ends and the offensive line this week on the Wandering Buffalo podcast. You are now listening to the Wandering Buffalo podcast with your hosts, Justin Goddard and Andrew Chang. What's going on, Bills Mafia? This is Justin with the Wandering Buffalo podcast, a show brought to you on the Buffalo Fanbase Podcast Network. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, Just before we get started, this show is brought to you by 26 Shirts. Um, Founder of the company, Del Reed. Um, You guys probably seen him out there uh, nominated as the Buffalo Bills Fan of the Year. Um, Doing great work in the community. Awesome shirts. I got this one on right here. Um, So check them out. Um, I guess had awesome shirts. They're super comfortable, um, super good quality. Uh, Today on the podcast, we're going to be continuing our position review from the 2023 season, Um, just kind of evaluating where the roster's at, um, what we have going into um, this offseason before we deal with free agency draft, all that fun stuff. Um, And today we're going to continue it with the um, tight ends and the offensive line. Um, So far, we've covered the quarterback room and the running backs. So if you missed either of those episodes, uh, make sure you take a look back and check those out. Um, But today, I I was originally going to put the tight ends and the wide receivers together um, to kind of bring a close to, I guess, kind of the skill positions for Josh Allen. Um you know, our, our pass catchers, our offensive weapons. Um, but I kind of wanted to put these two together, um, just because of, of where we stand with these two sets of positions, um, versus what the wide receiver room looks like. Um, so I wanted to be able to dedicate a little bit more time to the wide receiver room. Um, so tune in next week. That's when I'm going to be breaking down the wide receivers. Um, but just kind of jump right into the to the tight end group. We're not really going to talk about the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. Um, whatever. I'm sick of seeing it. You're sick of seeing it. The only thing to do is go out there and beat them, right? Um, little dynasty going, and uh, sucks that we went right from the Patriots to the Chiefs, and we finally got a you know a quarterback and a team, and we're running into another roadblock. Um, I believe in this team. I believe we'll we'll get over the hump. And I know we've been saying it for for decades, but next year, right? Uh, so getting into the tight ends, obviously Dawson Knox, Dalton Kin- Dalton Kincaid. I'm sorry, uh, Trey McKitty and Zach Davidson, um, as well as uh, Quentin Morris. And this is a group that. I was very pleased with on this previous season. And like I said, I kind of wanted to start here because I I don't think it requires much work from the team. Um, When you look at what we saw from Dalton Kincaid coming in his rookie year, I think it was very encouraging. Um, I think he kind of came along more as the season went and kind of the sky's for the limit right hand, right? The sky is the limit for him right now. Um, as we saw his usage go up throughout the season, um, his productivity kind of really emerging as that as that player that we were hoping we we drafted when we took him in the first round. Um, I know a ton of people wanted receiver, um, didn't really want to move to this this twelve personnel, um, but the way I see it is the league is is beginning to shift um, kind of away from this high-flying, you know, passing league that it's been um, with all the explosive plays. We saw the Bills kind of on on the front end of this trend of, you know, the, the cover two shell, keep it in front of you. Um, you're going to allow a lot of receptions, a lot of passing yards, um, but you want to come up and make the tackle. Um I think we've seen this throughout the league where it's kind of we're going to we're going to keep everything in front of us and if you want to score you got to beat us on a 13 play drive and 
you know, we're, we're not letting anything behind us. Um, so a, a, as we see more teams start to um, do that effectively, I think we're going to start to see a shift in the NFL and, and for what it's worth for any complaints we have about this coaching staff, it seems like they've kind of been, um, on, on the, like the starting end of some of these trends. Um, and I, I think right now we're witnessing the, there's going to be across the league, more 12 personnel. The run game is going to become more important than it's been. We're going to start seeing running backs getting paid again. Um, and, and I think there's a myriad of factors that go into that. Um, not just, you know, defenses finding ways to limit offenses and the explosives, but also when you start seeing these number one receivers are, are starting to sniff at what, $40 million a year. Um, and most of these teams here, you know, they're not trotting out one number one receiver at this point. Um, you got to have two, three guys to have an effective passing game. Um, so I think the counter to that, like I said, is going to kind of be an increased uh, emphasis on, you know, the underneath game, the tight ends, the running backs, uh, and and really just kind of building to be able to sustain those drives. Um, I think we saw it across the league. You know, there's a lot of talk of it being, you know, kind of uh, a down year offensively across the league. I don't really, I mean, yeah, the numbers weren't there like they've been in the past, but I think that speaks more to defenses adjusting to to what offenses have been doing than offenses being down, if that makes sense. Um, obviously, kind of moved into the number two role was Dawson Knox. I've seen a ton of people talking about uh, we got to trade him. We got to get out of this contract, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm going to let you know right now, Dawson. I'll give it like a 99%. Um, Dawson Knox is on this roster next year. Um, and for what it's worth, I'm I'm not horribly mad about it. Um, I think Kincaid's emergence really changes the perspective on Dawson Knox. But I think. Dawson Knox would still be a tight end one on a ton of teams. He still has um, the athleticism to be dangerous in the passing game. He provides a ton in the blocking game and he just got extended the dead cap that he has. Um, what we'd still have to eat, even if we traded him, let alone get a team to trade for that contract. I, I just don't see it re being realistic. And if you did get a team to take that contract, the return you're going to get for him is, is going to be devalued just because of how much money he's making. Um, so kind of the way that I've been looking at this makes me feel warm and fuzzy is I, I just pretend that the contracts are, are flipped for Knox and Kincaid and we're super psyched that we, we have Kincaid locked up long-term uh, and Dawson Knox is making a nice uh, rookie, rookie wage scale. Um, I can't think of too many one, two punches at the tight end position. Um, that would be better than that across the league. Um, so while we wish Knox's contract was a little bit different, um, I still see, <clears throat> I still see him as a player that has a lot of value to this roster and let's not forget that he, he did play injured this year, ended up missing time. Um, with like a broken wrist and honestly didn't, didn't quite look right when he came back. Um, it's hard to say with Dawson Knox cause he's always kind of had some issues with his hands. Um, but if we have him as, <clears throat> I don't know what, what are we talking? Fourth, fifth receiving option, um, in the passing game. That can be somebody that the defense kind of forgets about when they're having to cover Kincaid, Diggs, hopefully a wide receiver that we draft early, um, Khalil Shakir. I mean, there's it becomes a numbers game, and he can become a real mismatch, especially when we see 
you know, some of that RPO stuff that they do with Allen where, you know, he blocks for, you know, a second and a half and then leaks out. Um, so I'm happy to have him on the roster still. I know we're going to see a ton of talk all off season of, you know, how can we get out of that contract? Blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> There's no outs on that contract. He's not going anywhere. Um, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I've been wrong before. I just don't, I don't see it as, as a contract that we can move on from. Um, Quentin Morris, he's been a tremendous special teams player for us. And honestly, when he's had to step into like a tight end two role, I I've liked what I've seen out of him. It's not, you know, the same level play, um, but this is a position where, if if you get to your third tight end on most teams, I mean, you're not really expecting much. I think he's an adequate blocker. Um, he does some stuff in the passing game. So for that to be my tight end three, I'm I'm not mad about that at all. And then just a couple of guys on our practice squad um, last year, was Trey McKitty and Zach Davidson. Um, McKitty was somebody that was from a lot of places I listen to that know they're a lot smarter than me. Um, an intriguing prospect coming out a few years ago for somebody to be in the building and trying to take that, that third tight end spot away from Quentin Morris. Um, I like that as an option too. Um, come super cheap kind of has the, the pedigree that hopefully he could develop a little bit. And I'll just say if, if throughout the off season, he's playing well enough that he's going to take that job away from Quentin Morris. I, I just got done saying how pleased I've been with Quentin Morris. Um, so that kind of tells me a lot about kind of what's, what's going on there that he's able to play well enough to take that spot from him. Um, so if that's something that we see where he's able to earn that, tight end three spot um i think that speaks more to what he's doing throughout the offseason to take that job than kind of like a knock against quentin morris um but yeah the tight end room uh that's ready to rock for me going into the next season um would would i swap somebody up for dawson knox if we could save a bunch of money there sure maybe um i just uh I don't see many tight ends that would come in for too much better value to to serve as a, a number two tight end and, and get the production that I think we can get out of Dawson Knox. Um, and this kind of goes with with my, my thoughts of the league kind of moving back to a little bit more 12, a little bit more 21 personnel and having to kind of have two guys there um, I think it's a tough contract when you're looking at it right now, but as we see the season play out, um, he might kind of be an unsung hero type of dude. Um, just with what he provides blocking in the run game and, and the skill set that he does still have. Um, and then Dalton Kincaid, like I said, he showed tremendous growth throughout his rookie year. And it's not like he started from this absolute bottom of the barrel, nothing. I mean, he was pretty productive early on and he just kept expanding and um, we'll get to the receivers next week, but between him and what Shakir looked like down the stretch, um, I think that's kind of two, two big question marks for offensive weapons going into this previous season that, are going to be taking on bigger roles and have shown that they, they can be reliable and, and very productive. Um, so super encouraged from what I saw from Kincaid and excited for what Knox still brings to the table, despite, despite the price tag. Um, but easy peasy on the tight ends. Uh, I'm going to take a quick break. When I come back, we're going to talk offensive line. Stick around. Hey, this is Bill's Vader. Now back to the show. 
Welcome back in and thank you again for joining me on this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo podcast. Um, as always, if you've made it this far, um, if you're already doing it, I appreciate you. But I do ask that you like, share, subscribe, take a second to text somebody about the show. Um, it really helps us put the show out every week and and spread the word. Just get the, the Bills Mafia community growing. Um, as I mentioned, I want to come back and talk about the offensive line this year which was a super bright spot for me that, again, going into this previous season, we had some questions on. And I think my biggest concern was this side, the offensive line has been one of those areas where Bean has tried and tried and had struggles, you know, getting the right five together. Um, usually mostly at the left guard position. Um, but overall this, this has been the best offensive line that we've seen in front of Josh Allen in, in my opinion. And the beautiful thing about it is it's a pretty young group of guys together. Um, so much like the tight end room, a little bit of status quo here, and I'm pretty good headed into next season. Um, so obviously left tackle, we had the snowman um, next to him. Uh, Connor McGovern brought in last season. Uh, Mitch Morris at center. Uh, uh, the rookie Osiris Torrance at right guard and Spencer Brown at right tackle. Um, this group played the whole season together and they just kind of got better throughout the season. Uh, there were so many games two years ago where we're talking about, you know, it looked different, right? Like the Bills were winning more games more easily, but also like the offensive line was a mess. Um, I think we really locked in a good starting five here. And the first person I want to talk about is Mitch Morse because he comes up every year as this potential cap casualty. Um, and... I don't know. I, I feel like every year he gets talked about and it, it's just something that I, I don't particularly want to see happen. Um, I feel like he's been around forever and I always think that he's much older than he is. Um, I believe he's 30 years old. Um, I would be much more inclined to kind of restructure slash extend him. Um, maybe take him out to like 34 or 35. Um, and free up some money that way, then I would be to cut him. Um, I do think you have Ryan Bates kind of waiting in the wings to to be his replacement, and it's a great option to have, but with how consistent this line was this year, it it's not something I want to mess with. Um, Deion Dawkins at the left tackle, I thought this was maybe his best year as a pro. Um and I think there's been a lot of talk in the past about how he's kind of average, overrated, whatever. I, I think it kind of had a lot to do with who we kept putting at left guard next to him. Um, that that was kind of making him make up for, for some mistakes from the left guard. Um, and I had my questions about Connor McGovern going into the season only because of how much we've struggled at that position in the past. And I was really excited for him coming in, but he, you don't really know until the games are played. And I thought Deion Dawkins kind of solidified himself as not, not just like an above average left tackle in this league. Uh, I, I thought he looked like you could talk about him in the top five, top 10 left tackles in the league conversation this year. Um, the, the one move that I kept seeing from him this year that I absolutely love because it makes the defender look so silly is he, he kind of like lets the defender get into his pads and then kind of drops their hands and they just kind of <laughs> flop face first, um, saw that a ton from him this year. And just overall, I thought he had a great season. He, he takes some penalties here and there, but I, overall I, I was Really pleased with his season. Um, talked about McGovern there a little bit. I think he was 
Loki may be the best free agent that we added this past season. And there were some good ones in there. Um, Floyd in particular had a tremendous season. Um, I just, for, for how much we've struggled at that left guard spot, um, he got, I believe the biggest contract we gave out last off season. And to me, it was worth every penny. Um, Josh Allen was towards the bottom of the league for sacks taken last season. And I, I think between the two guard spots, um, that's what really solidified this offensive line because we we know what we have um, in Deion Dawkins and Mitch Morse, and we saw the flashes from Spencer Brown. And, you know, yes, he was a huge question mark coming into this past season, um, but it was also you know whatever call them excuses, but came in in the really weird COVID season. Following season, you know, has back surgery not really preparing until the season's about to start. This was kind of the first year that we saw him with a full off season body of work and myself included. It was in area of concern. I was leaning on the side of Spencer Brown being able to put it all together. Um, and then kind of with the flashes that he had with the athleticism that he had, um, kind of being able to lock down that spot. And I think we saw that from him this year. Um, he's somebody that I went from, we really need to see it this season to, I'd be good with extending him right now. Um, and then add into that mix, rookie Osiris Torrance. Uh, absolutely love this draft pick when we took him. Um, it's not somewhere that we often see the Bills um, make a big investment. We don't really see a ton of investment on the offensive line uh, through the draft. We saw obviously Cody Ford and we know how that panned out. Um, but other high draft picks we haven't really seen. We've seen kind of like these sixth and seventh round picks that are getting snagged off the, off the practice squad and we never really get to see them play. Um, so, um, Torrance in his rookie year, uh, I think towards the end of the season, there was a little bit of a dip, maybe that rookie wall, um, but he kind of popped back up and and looked good again. And this is the dude that in his rookie year took 100% of offensive snaps, which you, you just don't see. Um, so overall, I mean, that, that front five right there, I wouldn't touch a thing. I wouldn't change a thing. And then even as we get into the depth, um, there's not there's not really much I'd be looking to change as far as the depth goes. We have um, Vandemark, who ended up being kind of the first guy in um, when we saw anybody go out for a little bit with injuries, whatever. Um, and I, I thought he looked great when he came in. He's somebody that I'm kind of excited to see develop and see, you know, maybe he can be that long term swim swing tackle. Um, Richard Garage, we didn't see a ton from, but again, the the bits that we did see from him, uh, I was super encouraged by. Um, Tommy Doyle still in the mix, and I, I think this would be my biggest question with the depth, um, just because we haven't seen a ton from him. He's had, you know, back to back season ending ACL injuries. I'm excited for him still. If he can bounce back, he should be ready to go because he had that knee injury early in the season. And he was a dude that we drafted, I believe it was the fifth round, and kind of had that similar size and athleticism um, that we saw in Spencer Brown. And, you know, does he still have that juice? It's hard to say after, you know, two pretty brutal injuries. Um uh, but he's somebody that I, I'm at least excited to see get out there and hopefully he can remain healthy. And I, I think that that's long-term swing tackle spot is kind of between him and uh, Vandemark right now. And it's just a matter of 
if he can stay healthy and start putting everything together. Um, and then the backup guard positions, Kevin Jarvis and Ryan Bates. Again, Kevin Jarvis, somebody that we didn't see very much from. Um, but we've talked about Ryan Bates so much in the past and kind of what he brings to this team. Um, going back, uh, I don't know, two, two, three years ago, I was a giant Ryan Bates hater. <laughs> um, I, I had him pegged as this, oh, he can back up all five positions. That's great but he's mid at all of them. I'd rather have, you know, somebody that's really great and can only do one or two positions. Um, he's been somebody that's been around the team for a long time. And like I mentioned previously, um, if anything does happen with Mitch Morse, he's, he's probably the, the replacement at center there. Um, as of right now, I, I have him kind of pegged as, the high end first guy off the bench. If any one of the interior guys goes down, I do like that. We've kind of filled out the depth in the tackle room, you know, so he's not the first guy off the bench for all five positions. Um, that's still something that I was never in love with, but being that we have some options at the tackle spots, um, if anything does happen, I, I feel good about Bates coming in. If, if he's, the weakest link you have across the offensive line. I think you still have a very good unit there. Um, and he's somebody that I like keeping in the building because, you know, father time does catch up eventually. And to me, Mitch Morse still looked great. Um, I think he's, it's a matter of time, right? Um, uh, whether it's a year, two years, three years, whatever. Um, Bates isn't costing us a lot of money. He's, like I said, uh, a high end, high end talent for being a backup that can come in and cover three spots. Um, the only thing I'd really like to see change with this group, whether it's you know through the draft, free agency, whatever, probably the draft. Um, not not a super high investment type guy. Maybe maybe the later rounds. Um, maybe start looking for that that center of the future um whether whether you know Morse is here or not if Bates gets promoted um i want to start looking for that next Bates right um somebody that can come in and and be high end depth for a couple positions we saw it with Eric Wood back in the day where he was kind of drafted as a guard and and moved over to center after a uh, season or two um that would be really the only thing I would be looking to add to this room. It's and it's just kind of if the if the draft board falls how it falls, you got the guys you wanted and you're sitting in there the fifth, sixth round, and it's a guy you were looking at that's standing out on the board. Um, I don't think it's a huge urgent priority. Uh, I think it's kind of a move more looking towards the future. Um, but with this roster that we have put together, we, we have a team that's going to be, hopefully, <laughs> I know we almost missed it this year. Um, but hopefully, you know, in the playoffs every year in the conversation of, you know, can we get over the hump and win the Super Bowl? So I don't, I don't think there's a huge ton of priorities that need to be addressed in the draft. So when you get to those later rounds, I'm good with, you know, looking at, um, a center for the future, you know, maybe Ryan Bates at some point wants out because he thinks that he can get that starting opportunity somewhere else. Um, so yeah, other than that, offensive line is tight. Love this group of guys together. Um, and I think we have to kind of give ourselves the reminder, um, is their first year with Aaron Cromer, um, their first year all playing together we had a rookie in there um playing all of the snaps i think this unit kind of can only go up from here um hopefully they can all stay healthy again i know it's kind of an anomaly across the league to see all five guys play all the games together um but i love 
seeing what Aaron Cromer got out of these guys. We're going to be going into year two with that. Um, year two tends to be a big year for a lot of players because you're you're focused only on this system, this team, you know, this level of football all year, and you're not doing, you know, the scouting combines, and you're not doing the pro days, and you're not doing, you know, all this and that to get yourself acclimated to the league. You, you know, a little bit more of what it what it takes to succeed in this league. Um, just coming in ready to work, and like I said, this is overall a fairly young group of guys together that I think we could see together for another another couple of years and I think they had a a huge role in keeping Josh Allen not just keeping Josh Allen clean but also the success that we saw in the run game um that we've we've struggled with in previous seasons um so yeah that's kind of the two position groups I lumped the whole offensive line together but between that offensive line and the tight end room I think that's two areas that we can kind of take off of free agency wish lists, draft boards, all that, you know, like I said, unless there's kind of an outlier staring at you that you can't ignore. Um, these are two position groups that I'm feeling really good going into um, this next season with. Um, that's going to wrap it up for today. Like I said, come back next week. We'll be talking about the receivers. I'm giving that position group a day of its own. I think there's, uh, a lot more questions, some drama, some intrigue. It, it's got it all. Um, some future hopes there. Um, so next week is going to be a good conversation about the direction of that position group and kind of what I hope it looks like going forward. And it will probably be <laughs> nothing like what we end up seeing. Uh, but make sure you tune in for that episode. Uh, again, if you haven't done so already, check out the website, wanderingbuff.com. Um, we're going to have some articles going up just, you know, talking about offseason, free agency preview, draft preview, all that kind of stuff. And we're going to be dropping every Wednesday. I know this one might be coming out a little late. We'll see what happens. Um, some things came up with myself. Some things came up with our producer. Um, so this one might be dropping a day late. But it's the off season. Things are weird. Um, so make sure you're subscribed and you won't miss any of them. Um, but thank you again for tuning in this week. And as always, go Bills.